I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. Flexibility, convenience, opportunity. Find your digital advantage in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. Backed by the most trusted name in thoroughbred sales. Visit KeenelandDigital.com to learn more. Good morning. It is 9.09 Wednesday, July 14th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland back in our Red Bank studios. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor, editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. Still can't believe that I remembered the code to get into the building today. So true story. Last week, we set a new record for the number of viewers, listeners, etc. Congratulations to everybody. I heard it's because of Finley. It's like, wow, I'm finally getting some love, finally getting some respect <laughs> that I deserve. It was because of Terry Finley was our guest. Now, see, I, I, no title, no respect. It, it, it just never stops. You were so close, Bill. You yeah. were so close <laughs> to being a contender. Yeah. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And it's so great to have the band back together all in one room again. <laughs> Let's see if we can get through the entire show without killing each other. <laughs> the boys are back in town for now, at least. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland, home of the world's yearling sale. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September yearling sale starting Monday, September 13th. You can learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. So we didn't have a huge racing weekend for our return to the studio. Apparently the schedulers of the of all the racetracks in America didn't really want that to coincide with this triumphant return. But we did have the Belmont Oaks and the Derby over the weekend. And, and the big story was Aiden O'Brien winning both races. The other big story was winning uh, one of them with a, a, a progeny of Galileo, who unfortunately passed away last week. One of the most influential sires of the last 20 years across the world. We're going to talk to Kelsey Riley, I think, in a little bit uh, about him and, and his legacy. But, you know, it wasn't it w wasn't a super exciting, scintillating performance. I don't think by either of them, by uh, by Bolshoi Bal Bal Ballet or Santa Barbara. But, you know, I I. One of the things I like about that, the new the advent of the Belmont Turf Festival, Stars and Stripes Turf, Turf Festival, is the way it attracts European participation. I think that, you know, any any time you can make the, the U.S. turf racing more attractive to European connections and to global connections, I think that's a good thing. And it, it just continues with the pattern of, of, you know, the developing nature of, of American turf racing and how it becomes a larger and larger part of the racing landscape as a whole. But those were those were the two big results over the weekend uh, I wonder if you guys have any any thoughts about about them but also about the upcoming weekend which we're, we're gonna be treated to the start of Saratoga and Del Mar uh, Saratoga starts tomorrow Del Mar starts on Friday we're gonna look forward to that as well but any thoughts from you guys on the Belmar races or on those two meets well first of all don't forget the Haskell on Saturday no, here, Joe, sorry, right around the bad. corner here from our studio yes. in uh, Oceanport New Jersey uh, let's start off with the uh, the races over the weekend. Yes, of course, the story was Aiden O'Brien. I, you um, sort of downplayed the performances. I, I was more impressed by them uh, than apparently you were. Uh, you know, both horses didn't have terrible trips. It was kind of difficult trips, having to find room, uh, slow pace, et cetera, and getting the job done. But I, I think what maybe, uh, you know, what Aiden O'Brien might have done here is, remember going into the Breeders' Cup, he had that terrible losing streak in, in North America. I don't remember the numbers, but it was, a, a, I believe, well over a year and a half he hadn't won a race. And I think he's figured out no more bringing the C team over here. I mean, these were good, good horses, Santa Barbara and the Belmont Oaks and Bolshoi Ballet and the Belmont Derby. Um, uh, Bolshoi Ballet was the favorite in the Epsom Derby, even though he didn't run real well. And uh, Santa Barbara was a favorite in the Epsom, Epsom Oaks. Uh, I don't imagine we'll see them back in the United States until the Breeders' Cup. But at this point in time, um, I thought both ran well enough to be considered serious Breeders' Cup contenders. Uh, again, in a year where there's no American turf superstars out there. The thing that, that really surprised me wasn't that, uh, you know, Euros finished in the top three in both races. Uh, two out of the top three horses were European. Um, but what surprised me the most was that our horse, we actually bought a horse named Maceto, um, and he was actually on the plane with the two horses that won both those two races. So hopefully that'll be, you know, some good luck for us. Um, but the amazing thing about it is that if I told you that the horses came out, flew over five days before the race, and then we're, you know, quarantined for a couple of days, galloped on the racetrack, on the dirt racetrack, and then still put in those kind of performances where their final quarter of their respective races were faster than any other quarter to the entire race. I mean, that blows my mind. We're so used to having 
horses ship in and they have to train on the racetrack for a couple of weeks and they have to get to know their surroundings. I mean, these two horses in particular that, that one um, must be so easy to, to, to ship and have such great personalities that, and temperaments that they were able to come over on a, you know, on a, basically an overnight flight, be in different surroundings, um, not train on the turf course and still put in phenomenal efforts to me they you know i think i think Aiden o'brien and his team have have figured out the, uh, the the formula now it's not coming over months in advance it's coming over getting them situated and then running um and and obviously the uh, the results are, are there yeah and, and I, didn't, I didn't mean to downplay the, the efforts the, the thing that i did like about both of those performances is they they overcame slow paces and the 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 race the dynamics really didn't set up for them that well i the only, my only strong opinion of the day uh was cellist who I thought I needed that horse to, to hold on to second, couldn't quite do it, but, you know, really had no excuse up on a slow pace. So I think that that, that was the, the impressive part of it. And I think that one thing that the Europeans still have over us is the, the distance horses, especially this early in the season. I just think you don't, you know, the, the Derby and the, and the Belmont are outliers, especially with turf races. There's really nowhere to go really a mile and an eighth even for U.S. turf horses right now. So I think that the European contingents are always going to have that kind of advantage because they're, they have more stamina and they have more bottom this early in their careers. And, you know, I assume we're going to see both of those horses back for the Breeders' Cup. So that, that'll be good. And, and, and it'll, it'll, it'd be interesting to see them develop through the rest, the rest of the summer in Europe and then what kind of horses they are if and when they come back uh, for the Breeders' Cup. But I just I wanted to wanted to talk about about Saratoga real quick. Um, you know, it there's there's some good stakes action, and and you got two stakes on opening day. Golden Pal is going to make his three year old debut in the Quick Call. I uh, got a pretty good field in the Schuylerville, though. Or I think Happy Soul is going to be very tough in there. Is going is going to be pretty heavy heavily favored. But the the thing that I th- would like to talk about about Saratoga this year, and there was a good column today in the TDN by Mike Kane about the the downtown bars and restaurants and how they've, you know, they really had to struggle and scratch and survive last summer without all the tourism that Saratoga usually has. And you know, if you've never been to Saratoga, one thing that 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 makes it unique is what a fan driven place it is. You know, I think uh, unlike any other racetrack or you know very few honestly sporting events in america saratoga is all about the fans and all about the atmosphere that the fans provide you know if you walk take a walk through the backyard at saratoga it's impossible not to feel the energy of the people and the spectators and just how excited everybody else everybody is to be there and it's an interesting place where people kind of can you know reunite you know, people you see once a year only, and you, you can come back and reunite and have a have a weekend at Saratoga. So that's something that I'm I'm particularly excited about. You know, not just the racing, but just having that atmosphere back where all those people can just hang out and you know let loose after a year of being cooped up, and really can support the the businesses in Saratoga too, because you know there aren't a ton of chain places in Saratoga. It's mostly small businesses, and that's gonna be that's gonna be huge for the town, and I think it's gonna it's gonna be huge for Naira and just everybody that's a part of Saratoga every year. We've been waiting for this. It feels like forever, and that that's what I'm more excited about than anything, even even the racing parts of it. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more, Joe. I, I mean, especially in the first couple of days, that's the story more so than who's running in this race and who might be uh, doing well coming into the Travers, et cetera. Uh, I don't think any of us, I, I know owners were allowed in and, and media last year. I don't believe any of us were there at, at any one time. And, you know, that it, Saratoga is electric enough as it is. You know, it's a place where a Belmont on a Thursday afternoon, there literally might be six or 700 people there. Saratoga on a Thursday afternoon, the stands are going to be nearly full. There's going to be that vibe in there. And that's the thing that makes Saratoga so special. So especially in the first couple of days, I, I mean, I think the energy and the environment, they're gonna, it's going to be like almost like, you know, the NBA finals or something's going on right now. I think they're going to blow the roof off place. And, you know, kudos to Naira for getting through a tough time. Kudos to all the local businesses. But, you know, to be able to say here something that we haven't been able to say for what, a year and a half, Saratoga is back. That is absolutely tremendous. It's tremendous for the town. It's tremendous for Naira. It's tremendous for everybody who likes horse racing. I think all things considered, this is going to be one of the most memorable meets in the track's history for all the reasons we just said. I really hope so. One of the, uh, you know, one of my fondest memories in going to Saratoga is as a, as a kid and just walking around and, and Joe, you alluded to this, you know, families get together, they make it a focal point of a meeting point. We're going to meet 
you know, on this weekend of, of, uh, of the year and it's the same weekend every year and families come and friends come and, and it's just, there's a lot of camaraderie and it's different than most racetracks. I think the only other racetrack that I can say has the same kind of feel is when you go to Keeneland, um, you know, for the April meet or for the October meet. And it's the same idea where people are coming in and it's almost like the races are important, but they're almost in the background. It's the idea of congregating and getting together and, and seeing old friends and seeing family and, and then, oh, by the way, there's races going on. So I can also, you know, gamble and, and drink a little bit and, and have a good time. So it almost doesn't matter what is on the card. And they do have a strong card for the opening weekend. It almost doesn't matter, though. They could have a bunch of, you know, uh, uh, maiden 25s and, and have full fields because people just want to go. They want to go. They want to be there. They want to be a part of some energy, group energy um, that we've all been missing out on. And I think you saw that a little bit at the um, at the Phasic July sale uh, this past week where people were so excited to be there and be out and be doing something other than just kind of puttering around their their own um, domain that it does add to the excitement. It does add to the, 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 the fever of it. And, and, and there's a palpable energy to it. So, um, I can't wait to, to get back up there again. And, and it's not even so much to see the horses, it's to see people and to see, you know, and talk to them and find out what's been going on in their lives and just kind of catching up and getting back to normal. Like, like we said, when we walked into the studio for the first time since March, it, you know, it, it, it's nice to get back to some sense of normalcy. Yeah. Well, I think that's kind of an, an interesting, uh, kind of alignment that we're back in the studio for the first time the day before Saratoga starts. And that's, it's kind of like we're launching back into, into normal life here in racing. And, and Saratoga is one of those places. It's, it's one of the very few places I think where the, the, the plate, like, like we were saying, the place itself and the people that go there are the attraction. You know, the horses obviously are part of the attraction as well, but it's, it's kind of, it's kind of beside the point, the whole, the, the place itself is a monument. And it's, it's a living, breathing monument. And it's, you know, like if you've never been there, it's, you, you gotta go. It's a bucket list thing, I think for sure, because it's, it's a relatively unchanged since the 1860s. It looks, it looks very, sim very similar. Obviously they've done some renovations along the way, but it's just, it, it's one of those places that seemed, seems untouched by history and yet is still as relevant as it was at any time in history. And I, I think that that that's what makes it so special. So we're all looking forward to that. We're all looking looking forward to, to getting up there and doing the the hundredth show there. But you know, there's it's, I'm I'm just I'm happy for people. I'm happy for the business owners first of all that, that had to get through last year with no tourism. That was that that was a big time struggle for for them and 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 for the local community. So I'm happy for them most of all. But I'm also happy for all the people that get to go up there that missed it so much last year. And you know, I'm one of those people. I've only last year was only the second time since I started going to Saratoga in 2005 that I've missed a summer there that, so that was, that, that was a big change for me. And, and I think a lot of people felt that, that, that kind of interruption to their yearly pilgrimage and their yearly tradition to, to get up there and to, to see friends and, and family. And the other interesting thing about Saratoga is like, it's, it's a central location kind of for the entire Northeast. Like it's not just New York people. It's not just downstate people. It's not just upstate people. You get people from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, all over the place where Saratoga is a central location for them in the summer. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Owning multiple grade stakes winning racehorses like Decorated Invader or potential future stars like First Captain is attainable with a racing partnership with West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. And I don't want to be remiss and, and leave out Del Mar too, because obviously Del Mar is, is a big meeting place in Southern California and another place that I think people are really going to be excited to, to have fans back at that seaside oval. It's another very fan centric meet. And, you know, I think Del Mar in, in particular is it deserves good fortune 
because of their safety record, their safety record, the last handful of years has just been absolutely incredible. And we hope for more of that. And in the, in the, in this meet as I knock on, on wood and, and screw up the distortion of the microphone. Um, but no, I mean, so, so I don't want to, I don't want to uh, leave out Del Mar either. Cause I know there are a lot of people that really, really care about that meet and we're, we're excited for that as well. Uh, but obviously we're New York guys. So Saratoga is a little closer to our hearts, but we're very excited for both of those meets. And it's going to be basically just Saratoga and Del Mar for the rest of the summer that we're going to be focusing on it's going to be a lot of high quality racing and and delmar also has the breeders cup this year as well so that's that it'll be interesting to see what horses kind of handle that track and and you know maybe may, maybe you know prove themselves in in a and punch their tickets for the breeders cup over that turf and that track uh but some other big action this weekend we got the haskell at bonmouth um which bill mentioned is, is right around the corner from us you know it's probably going to be a pretty short field but i think i i, I disagree with these guys they're not a fan of the quality of the race but i I don't know. I think with with Hot Rod Charlie in there, who I think can give anybody a run for their money as the top three year old in the country. It's basically him and Essential Quality right now, one two. However you want to slice it, Mandaloon, who you know maybe wasn't super super impressive in the Pegasus, but you got to think that that was a prep for this. He has a, as good a chance as anybody to win champion three year old as well. Uh, Midnight Bourbon's going to be in there. He ran second in the Preakness, I believe, the last time we saw him. But the most interesting horse to me is following C and I believe he's going to run. Well, maybe I'll be proven wrong by the time the entries come out, but following C I think is, you know, maybe pound for pound, the most talented three-year-old in the country. The problem is he's only gone six, six and a half furlongs. He doesn't necessarily have a, a, a two turn pedigree, but he's going to get his chance here in the Haskell. And I think it's a good spot from, from Todd Pletcher. And, and I think that he, it, it makes sense in a, you know, typically, typically, typically a race that, speed does well I, and a track that speed does well on. I think that's, this is the right spot to try him and, and not necessarily the Jim Dandy at Saratoga over a much more generally demanding dirt track. And, and one that plays, I think a little bit, bit more fair than Monmouth overall, but he, he is the wild card to me because I think he might be, like I said, the best three-year-old in the country, but he's got to prove it going around two turns. I and mean, if it doesn't go well, I think he's going to have a huge monster year. He's the, maybe the best pr- sprinter I've seen since Matoli. Uh, um, so that's that's going to be an interesting clash. It'll be interesting to see how the race is, is run. we got a bunch of other action uh, on, on the weekend that I'll get to, but I want to hear Bill and John's thoughts about the Haskell. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Haskell is what, what it is. It's a great race every year. It's a big, uh, big event. Uh, in a perfect world, you'd like to see the three Triple Crown winners get back together. We're getting instead the three Triple Crown runners up meeting in the Haskell stakes. Um, and But um, someday, Mandaloon, presumably will be the Kentucky Derby winner. It might be sometime in 2029 or something like that uh, after uh, all these legal wranglings uh, get through. Uh, Joe, you're excited about, you know, one horse in the race. I, I'm not, I wouldn't say necessarily I'm excited about Hot Rod Charlie because he's a known commodity, but I, I think what this race is going to be about, it, it, I think this race is, is more or less about him more so than anybody else, because if he wins this and particularly wins it easily, off that Belmont where he ran his eyeballs out, got caught up in that fast pace, off of Belmont where a lot of people, maybe even the majority of people, thought he was best, on Sunday morning in next week's podcast, are we going to be saying, you know, sorry, Essential Quality, Hot Rod Charlie is the best three-year-old uh, in America. That's not going to happen if, if really anybody else wins this rate, Midnight Bourbon, um, Mandaloon, et cetera, even though Mandaloon, like I said, is, is going to be the Kentucky Derby w- winner someday. I think the race is all about Hot Rod Charlie, and if he can live up to the expectations now on him after uh, just a sensational runner-up performance in the Belmont Stakes. So we shall see. Yeah, I think if you're going to Haskell Week, if you're going to Haskell Day, uh, you know, to Monmouth Park, it's to watch the undercard races. It's definitely not to watch the wow. the Haskell. Um, I mean, you know, you guys mentioned the top three horses, which are fine, but the other horses that are potentially in the race, um, you know, Joe, you mentioned, uh, you know, a sprinter that's trying to to you know not only stretch out, but stretch out the nine furlongs, which is really tough to do. Um, another horse that won first time out and it didn't finish better than fourth. Before, you know, since then in, in four or five races, um, you have Holland Duffer's horse anti-gravity that took 10 times to break his maiden. Um, and then, you know, Kelly Green and Breen's got a horse that, that really doesn't deserve to be in here either. So it's, it's, it's really, it's a wow. matter of, 
Go ahead, Bill. Oh, I was just thinking so much for that opportunity to get Mama to be one of our sponsors. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, one of the things that people Thanks, love is John. that we call it like we see it. Yeah. Um, you know, and and this is this is also like you know a little bit of of uh, of you know sour grapes, if you will, from from me because I'm sitting there saying, why didn't we just run helium in 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 the you know save them for the Haskell because this is such a bad group. Now we probably couldn't beat like all these other horses I just mentioned couldn't beat Hot Rod Charlie, Midnight Bourbon, or, or Mandaloon. That, you know, fairness uh, the way it is. So you know, are people entering in the this race because it's a free parterre box and they get to, you know, have a free lunch and, and, you know, be there for Haskell day. Maybe, I mean, I can't speak for, for a lot of these other local owners that, that want to be in the Haskell and maybe it's a dream come true, but I would be absolutely flabbergasted shocked if any of those horses beat the top three, um, you know, for the, for the win in the Haskell. Um, as a matter of fact, I would, I would say that, that they're going to be hard pressed to beat the ambulance in this race. Oh my, oh my God. God. Oh, wow. It, something about being back in this room <laughs> to make, to makes John so <laughs> Super negative. Usually he's yeah. Mr. Sunshine. Um, yeah, I mean, I, when following C wins by 10 lengths and 146, and when you get to the 120 buyer, I don't want right. to hear any. Do, do I need to take out an ad? Uh, say, John, say that he's back. Are you going to the Haskell in person? I am not. I'm not, not well, going to be. Of course not. After, after, yeah, I was just wondering. I'm going to get stoned. Yeah, if I, I, go I was there. just wondering if you're going to leave after the Eaton Town, the eighth race, or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Yeah. The, match, the matchmaker <laughs> okay. historically is a good race. But one of the other things that that is is the story that we haven't even touched upon is that you know Bob Baffert dominates this race and he doesn't even have an entry in this race. So, um, you know, that, that's a bigger, you know, story I think than anything else is that Bob Baffert who wins this race, you know, almost like, like, uh, like, you know, like, like Joe changes his underwear on a, on a, on an annual basis. Um, you know, it just seems odd that he doesn't even have a horse in the race. Um, let alone not one of the favorites. Uh, he's rolling now. He's rolling, buddy. Um, yeah, I mean, what's who, who can he really run? He just ran a couple horses in the Los Al Derby. We have no idea where Medina Spirit is. I don't know. Like, who 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 does he have that can that can really mess with these top three or four horses? I uh, just wanted to run down. Well, wait, Joe. He's definitely got horses that are better than Anti Gravity Basso, Picking Time, and Following C, though. All right. Well, it still yeah, pays. Yeah, but why why ship three thousand miles to run four? Right. No, I I agree. I, right. I no, I agree with that. I was going to say well. fourth still pays if you're running out of your backyard for sure. Right. Yeah, and don't try to show up on Saturday now, John. After this, <laughs> after this tangent, <laughs> they'll stiff arm you right at the door. Um, I just wanted to run down some of the other stakes. Action. Um, it's coming up this weekend. We got the Forbidden Apple also on Friday at Saratoga. And then Saturday, we got a couple. We got the, the Arlington Million Preview Day, which has the American Derby, the Arlington Stakes, the Modesty. Uh, we got the San Diego Handicap at Del Mar, which is the traditional prep for the Pacific Classic later in the meet. Obviously, the Haskell in the United Nations, along with the Monmouth Cup, the Matchmaker, and the Molly Pitcher at Monmouth. So we got five stakes races down by the shore here. The Diana at Saratoga, probably going to have the one, two finishers for Charlie Appleby from the Just a Game Stakes. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of good action, Irish Oaks. I don't want to, I don't want to ne neglect the, uh, the overseas viewers. So that's, that's a big race as well. It looks like, hey, you know, Brian might have four or five horses in that race might have most of the field. Um, so a lot of good stuff to, to watch and to, to talk about and to, to debate. Uh, but yeah, all eyes will be on Saratoga for sure tomorrow and then Del Mar on Friday. And we're just, we're so happy to have those meets back and to have them at full capacity. It's a real blessing and it's a testament to the people who run those tracks and who, who run the businesses near the tracks that really persevered through this this whole shutdown and and we're happy and we're we're ready we're ready to kick it off for sure Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and high-class people like John Green and Bill Finley and stakes action for less than it cost to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse. Learn more at westpointtb.com. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TDN Writers Room is sponsored by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. So we're very, very excited to bring in Kelsey Riley, our excellent international editor at the TDN. Um, unfortunately, with some to, rep to report and opine on some sad news, which was the passing of Galileo last week. He was 23 years old. Uh, he had a 
terrific racing career. He won six times and eight starts. Uh, he, he won the Epsom Derby and the Irish Derby. But I think his uh, his legacy is, is more so as an outstanding, you know, just galactically important sire. He was he was really, you know, as, as influential as you can get um, for a sire and, and across the world, really, especially in Europe, but but across the world, there's just Galileo's eating up, eating up the turf everywhere you looked. Um, he was he was a tremendous sire and, and for Coolmore and, and for Aiden O'Brien, he was he, he added to Aiden O'Brien's legacy as a racehorse. Um, but Kelsey, do, let's just get some thoughts on on from you on his legacy and, and you know, going forward, how Galileo is going to be remembered. Yeah, you said it exactly right. Like he's been such an incredible sire that um, you know you almost forget what an incredible racehorse he was himself. Um, you know, to win the, the Derby, the Irish Derby, um, to do that double in the fashion that he did, and then to win the the King George, which is one of Britain's um, very top middle distance races. And um, you know, Aidan O'Brien always talked about just what a what a genuine horse he was, what a great attitude he had. And that seems to be one of the prevailing qualities that he's passed on to his offspring. You know, Aiden will often say a Galileo never gives up, um, you know, when they get into a fight. And, you know, as a result of that, he's just been an incredible sire of uh, 92 great or group one winners worldwide, which is more than any other sire in history. Um, And they do it, you know, they do it over, over every distance he's had. You know, he has top, top class stayers, um, brilliant milers. He's had champion two-year-olds. Um, he, it's just been incredible legs. Yeah, and, and Kelsey, one of the things that that really shocked me um, in looking through his stats, you mentioned one 92 group or grade one winners um, who won almost 200 group or grade one races themselves. But he's actually got 20 Plus, 20 plus sons that are standing at stud worldwide. Um, so his influence will be seen for generations and generations. And you also mentioned, you know, that he won some pretty heady races over in Europe. I think the only two races that he lost were at the very end of his career. He lost uh, in a photo finish, um, you know, running second. And then the last race of his career was, if I remember correctly, in the Breeders' Cup Classic on the dirt over here in the United States. So you can almost you know, cross that one off his his stellar, uh, you know, racing resume. But it, it, it the thing that, um, surprised me the most is when you look at Galileo and we're so used to seeing these big 17 hand behemoth horses here in the States. When you look at him, you would say, well, he's just a horse. I mean, he's 16 hands. He's kind of slight of build and, and, but he was very athletic. And like you mentioned, he had the determination, um, uh, and the, and the, the want to, um, in order to win some of these races, but he was correct me if I'm wrong. He was racing breeding royalty um you know between Sadler Wells and 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 Urban Sea I mean they were both champions and maybe talk a little bit about about that about just how good his pedigree was yeah absolutely uh you know at the time that uh that Galileo was born I think um I think Sadler's Wells already had nine of his 14 uh champion uh British and Irish uh, sire titles under his belt so, you know he was already you know that highly regarded Urban C was um, a, a Philly winner of the Ark, um, and at that time Galileo was her uh, was her third foal. So you know we still didn't know about her her record as a broodmare, and it's just amazing to to look back on it at this stage. Again, just as I mentioned, was the case with Galileo. He's been such a good sire. You almost forget what a brilliant racehorse he himself was. It's the same with Urban C. Um, her influence has just been has been absolutely massive. Um, after after Galileo, she turned around a few years later and produced uh, See the Stars, who is is one of the best horses uh, we've ever seen. Um, so yeah, he he went onto the race course with with extremely high expectations, and you know Aiden O'Brien has has always mentioned they uh, you know the team at Coolmore and, and John Magner had those extremely high hopes from him uh, right from the beginning, and uh, and huh, he certainly I would have to imagine surpassed their expectations. Yeah. And, and it's almost the equivalent guys for, for American racing. It's almost like if you bred secretariat to ruffian and ended up with Seattle slow, I mean, that that's how Royal and how deep and rich, um, you know, the pedigree is. And as Kelsey mentioned, it was, you know, breeding the best of the best. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to ask Kelsey too, about the, his, his legacy as a sire of sires and just kind of going forward, who do you think is going to carry the flag for him maybe for the longest time or, or at the top levels, because there are so many, he has so many, he has, like John said, you had 20 stallions to sires at, at uh, sons at stud. So, 
what what would you say, Kelsey? Who are the, who would be your uh, your top three or four sons of Galileo that you think are going to carry his legacy on? Uh, yeah, well, at the moment, it looks very much like Franco, who was uh, his best progeny on the race course and, and one of the, if not the best race horse, you know, that's ever been. And he uh, started out well and has just continued to, to build on that. And he's just taken off this year. He sired uh, the Derby winner and the Irish Derby winner this year, um, as well as he had um, the, the Fall Mistakes winner in uh, Snow Lantern last weekend. And uh, he's had I think, six or seven group one winners this year. So at this point, it, you know, if Frankel continues on the way that, that he has started, and there's absolutely no reason to think he won't, um, you would have to think it's going to be Frankel who's going to uh, really, you know, uh, carry that legacy forward. Um, but then there's the likes of uh, another or one of his uh, one of his five Derby winners, Australia, is also having a, a great season. Um, he sired, I believe, two Group One winners this season, um, and a couple of other really high class horses. So he's uh, he's a young sire who's really taken off. Um, he has Churchill, who's another young sire who, uh, like Australia, stands at Coolmore, and he has his first two year olds this year. He was a he was a winner of the Guineas and the uh, the Irish Guineas, and was a Group One winning two year old. So uh, there will be plenty of high hopes for him and he would have been supported with uh, plenty of good mares. Um, Tia Filo is, uh, is one of the earlier Galileos. He was his first champion two-year-old and he, um, he is actually the most accomplished son of, of Galileo with, I believe, 21 uh, group one winners. Um, so he's, you know, still very much among the top there. And then um, New Approach, who was also, he was the first of, of Galileo's five Derby winners, and uh, he's just he's a wonderful sire, and um, gets plenty of top class horses. And he uh, he is himself uh, sired a Derby winner in Massar, who's uh, who's now standing at Darley. And um, so you know Galileo, he himself uh, actually holds the record uh, for a number of Derby winners for a sire, um, and that's five. And he now has two sons, uh, Frankel and New Approach, who have themselves uh, sired Derby winners. So, you know, it's um, it's going to come in all directions uh, in terms of Galileo's sons. And, and very appropriate that he had his, his last, you know, to, to date, his last group one winner in, in Bolshe uh, Ballet win, um, you know, within 24 hours of, of Galileo's passing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that's a horse I think we can look forward to uh, for the rest of the year. He was um, there's there's no way around it. He was disappointing in the Derby, but, um, you know, Epsom just isn't a, isn't a race course that suits all horses. And, you know, Ryan Moore even mentioned after the race on Saturday, this horse is, is still learning. Um, I think it'll be really exciting to see uh, where that horse goes. Yeah. And I, you know, I was, I was trying to come up with an analog for, for Galileo dying and, and, you know, maybe an American sire that, that had that kind of legacy. And there really aren't that many, you know, in any country, anywhere in the world who had the legacy over, you know, now over multiple generations that Galileo had, but, but who would you compare him to in the American sire landscape? Oh, well, like you said, there's, there's very few and, and you have to think of the very, very top names. Um, I mean, I think the first thing that comes to mind is his own grandsire, Northern dancer. You know, I think he's, uh, I think he's, he and his own sire, Sadler's Wells, are, you know, so, uh, two of the most significant sires um, since Northern Dancer. Sadler's Wells had uh, 14 champion sire titles. Galileo is uh, is on 12 at the moment with, you know, every chance to, you know, match his sire with his with his next crops coming through. Um, you know, and, and of course, you have to think of the likes of Danzig, Mr. Prospector, Stormcat, AP Indy, like any any of those just just very top names. Right. Yeah. Well, well, well thanks for putting that in, into perspective for us, Kelsey, and for, for joining us on this kind of experimental first uh, podcast back in the studio. But but thanks for talking to us, Kelsey. We appreciate the insight. No problem at all. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk about Galileo. We'll be right back after this message from Legacy Bloodstock. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. 
just driving up and down the road every day. There's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we're super thrilled this week to bring on our Green Group Guest of the Week, who is bearing with us as we work through the kinks of returning to the studio, the excellent paddock analyst for Naira, Maggie Wolfendale. Thanks so much for coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me and getting really excited slash the Saratoga anxiety setting in as we are less than 24 hours, I suppose, a little more than 24 hours from first post opening day. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, how are are you settling in? Does it does it feel weird to be back there with people around now? Um, It doesn't feel weird. It feels amazing. I I think it's the it felt so strange last year. It felt like we were in a constant dress rehearsal with nobody at the track, which is something that we're obviously just not used to with, you know, over 150 years of it just being the summer place to be and nobody being there. So it's going to be great to have the fans back, um, to get heckled, to (laughs) hearing, just to have the ambient sounds of having people at a racetrack. Yeah, no, I was just, I was just, that was my first question was for people who haven't been to Saratoga, who don't really know what it's like. It's such a fan centric place and the fans are such a part of the atmosphere and the experience. Can you talk to maybe to that, to people who haven't been to Saratoga and don't know what it's like, how big of a part the fans are to Saratoga? It's not even just the racetrack. It's the entire town. It's just knows they're racing, such big fans. And you can go anywhere and sit down at a bar and just have a conversation about the third race on Friday. So, and then at the track, everybody has their own places that they, they want to be. There's something for everyone too. There's the backyard picnic area. There's the top of the stretch lounge, which is kind of like the new chic type place to be. And then there's the 1863 club, which is something new and air conditioned for people that need some air conditioning. Cause that we don't have a lot of at Saratoga because it is, it's like stepping back in time. Um, it's that old County fair feeling. It's, all about the horses too. I mean, people just line the massive paddock that we have, line the stre- uh, the walkway that they have from the backside to the paddock. It's like the boxers coming in for a, a, you know, a, a big fight. So it, it's really the anticipation before every race is something that I don't think you necessarily see at any other racetrack like you do at Saratoga. And Maggie, you brought about so many of the good points of Saratoga, but uh, let, let, let us not forget the racing, especially the stakes racing is absolutely tremendous. There's really no meet like it anywhere in the country. So be it this weekend coming up or the Travers, the entire meet, the Whitney, uh, are there any particular races you're looking forward to or horses you're looking forward to see run? Well, let's start with tomorrow, the return of Golden Pal in the quick call and pay, paying homage to quick call, who we did lose at the the ripe age of 32 last year. He was a, a stalwart at the Second Chances Program for the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. And today we're actually laying his ashes to rest in Clare Court, where he'll join four star Dave, uh, as well as a few others over there. Uh, so really playing, you know, a big homage to him, but Golden Powell was one of the most dazzling two-year-olds that we saw last year here up at the spa, winning the Skidmore. Where has he been since winning the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint? So really looking forward to him coming back. He was probably the most one of the most impressive two-year-olds I saw uh, up here, at least for the meet. So him coming back, looking forward to that. And then as you mentioned, the Whitney coming up too uh, in August, uh, first weekend in August, looking forward to seeing Maxfield, what he can do, stepping onto the Naira circuit, stepping into a grade one. It seems to have been someone, something that's somewhat elusive to him. Obviously you want a grade one as a two-year-old, but 
he seems to be really hitting stride and, and talking with his trainer, Brendan Walsh. He has said that that one defeat that he had in the Santa Anita handicap, it turned him into a man. It made him want it more. It made him more competitive and more engaged. And he's been training that way too. So really looking forward to seeing Max Field. We'll see where Mix, Mystic Guide and Happy Saver, all of which upset by Max Player in the Suburban a couple of weeks ago at Belmont, where they all show up if they go to the Jockey Club Gold Cup, which is now here at Saratoga. You know, the Jockey Club Gold Cup and the Woodward switching places uh, in the calendar and at different racetracks. So um, really looking forward to that. And then obviously the Travers. What uh, three-year-olds do we get to see showing up uh, a central quality? He's the leader of the pack as of now, and that looks to be his next target race. And then two, first captain for Shug McGahee. His ascent into stardom, into the big stratosphere of you know, the three-year-old conversation has been like a rocket ship. And Suge saying that after the Dwyer win, he's going to head to the Curlin, which ho hopefully springboards him to the Travers. And you mentioned so many of the good races that are coming up and, and all the, uh, the wonderful atmosphere at Saratoga. For me personally, one of the most exciting things about Saratoga are the two-year-olds. And um, everyone thinks that they have the next great horse and the Schuylerville will be the first uh, you know, two-year-old race coming in. When you're in the paddock, and you're watching whether it's the Schuylerville or even some of the maiden special weight races come, you know, uh, come to, together. You look at the field. How do you handicap them? What are you looking for um, on some of these horses that have only run, you know, maybe never, but have only run, you know, a handful of times? Yeah, we have two great two year old races uh, earlier on in the card tomorrow as well. But as you were saying, they're the least form to go on, but they take the most prep work. But then sometimes that prep work goes completely out the window once you see them in the paddock or on track in the preliminaries uh, before the race. So you do, you do your homework. You look at pedigrees who might have that precocious pedigree that it says they can win early, uh, who's suited to the surfaces, you know, who might be one that is crying out to get more distance as, you know, the two-year-old season progresses. We're going to start with the five and a half, the six furlongs, and then we'll get to seven furlongs later on in the meet. But two, uh, what, for instance, the Skylerville watching their first race, first races and who's run the fastest. And when you look at them physically, a lot of times it's the horse who is just the most physically mature, who's the most on down the road, if you will, from that physical standpoint. Um, whereas the other ones you can see, they're still developing to do because the ones that are that physically mature, they're just going to be bigger and stronger than the rest of their competition. Well, yeah, I mean, and you do a tremendous job in the paddock and you've made, you've made me a better handicapper and you've taught me how to look for certain things in horses. And, and, you know, I think that's, that's one of the real valuable things about you and the Naira broadcast is you guys come at it from all sorts of different angles. Um, and it's, it's really re required viewing. I think if you're, if you're into racing or you're a handicapper, but we're always learning, we're all always learning new things. So what are kind of some of the things that you've learned from doing that broadcast and then having all those different perspectives? Trust your first instinct. Uh, so many times, you know, you, you get influenced by maybe this horse taking money and, and a lot of times the money is right. Don't get me wrong. Um, but you walk into the paddock, you, or at least from my perspective, I don't look at the board. I just go in there with my PPs or sometimes I don't even look down at first. I just look at the horses and, and who they are. And, you know, and then I'll look down at my paper. The horse that catches your eye first is often the one that is one who's ready to run, the one that's the most talented. Um, so two, one other thing that I've incorporated and because it's more you know, accessible and available is watching the workouts. XBTV up here for the season, they post a lot of the workouts and really watching how horses move uh, over the racetrack, I think is an integral part to my handicapping now. But then again, sometimes too much information is too much and it, it, it backfires on you. So like I said, going in almost blindly in a way and trusting your first instinct is usually what I've learned is the best. 
Uh, let's give a plug for America's Day at the races. What, what was it called? Trying to do. Okay, <laughs> all right, yeah. Which is um, Saratoga, it changes its name for the Saratoga meet, but Maggie's a, a big part of that. And this is, I don't think we talk enough about this. This is historic to have virtually, maybe not even virtually, maybe every single race run at Saratoga on national TV, which is just a tremendous thing for the sport and New York racing in particular. But Maggie, I was wondering, so Joe talked about what you've taught him. Uh, when you're on the Naira broadcast or America's Day at the races, you're talking to Joe Joe Bianca, who is very well educated to the sport as it is, even though you're able to teach him some new things. And you're also talking to Al Pladugnik, who has been to the track three times in his life and just thinks it would be cool to watch the afternoon races at Saratoga. How do you straddle that line where you can appeal to both the hardcore racing fan and gambler and also the novice that, you know, wants to experience Saratoga, albeit by television? How can you talk to both without, you know, making Joe bored and making Al not know what the heck you're talking about yeah it's it's tough it's something that as you pointed out joe that's the one thing you're constantly learning because i grew up in the industry so it's so easy for me to fall into the horse racing jargon just you know spouting out things that the intense gambler horse player horse person is going to understand so that's when i do have to take that step back and and try to lay it out in layman's terms and and just maybe describe more what I'm seeing. And I think people that might not be that, uh, you know, educated in the sport and just casual fans, they can understand, uh, you know, an athlete, they can understand somebody describing an athlete to them. So that's what I try to do and maybe use, you know, analogies to different sports, um, to different athletes. So I think that's something that comes into play kind of using, those different things you can pull from, from different sports. And then two, just breaking it down. Maybe you use a word that uh, no, you know, the casual fans not going to understand. So take your time, take a deep breath, take a step back and explain that, which is something I constantly feel. So I have to work on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, 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 and it's amazing because we always straddle that line between talking jargon and, and trying to, you know, make the average fan, you know, enjoy it. And we've been fortunate. We have fans from all over the country that, that, you know, write to us and, and talk to us and it's very interactive. Do you find that, that your fans are just as interactive? Are they, you know, uh, direct messaging you and texting you and, and emailing you questions and, and critiques? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, Twitter is a great tool and, and people really connect with me through that. So I, I try to be as engaging and open and responsive as I possibly can with, with people. And so obviously in Saratoga, it ramps up and my apologies in advance if I, if I miss a tweet, uh, but know that I'm looking at all of them and I try my hardest to respond. And as you were mentioning, educate, if they have a question, I love trying to explain it and break it down for everybody. And, and Maggie, one of the questions I have for you is, um, you know, you're, you said you're, you've born into the business, you're third generation horsewoman, and, and you get to see a lot of things from behind the scenes. Are there a couple of young up and coming trainers that you would recommend to people who are starting to get into the business that maybe they're going to be the next Chad Brown or Todd Pletcher or fill in the blank? Well, I think, I don't think I'm unearthing anybody. Sorry, dogs, children, <laughs> either end. That's okay. The, the dog well, they, they more annoying than the children, which usually doesn't happen. But um, this is the first podcast in 16 months that our dogs have right, haven't right, been right, barking, exactly. so, so you're all good. You're keeping the tradition up. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. Um, not unearthing anything groundbreaking here, but Rob Atris does a tremendous job. You know, he but he's kind of already been on the scene and up and coming. Uh, there's a few new trainers that are coming to Saratoga. Obviously, Jack Sisterson, he's gotten the limelight quite a few times. He's won three grade ones, all of which in New York, and only one that he's been here for. <laughs> and <laughs> I knew it wouldn't last long, peace and quiet. Um, but there's a few new new trainers, and actually one of them used to be my uh, husband's assistant, my husband, Tom Morley, um, who's running a horse in the first race, first race in Saratoga, Michelle Giangiulio. And um, she does a great job. God bless her. She's doing everything herself. She has this long connection with um, 10 Strike Racing. So, and uh, Marshall Graham, and he's really been a supporter of her because her uncle is Juan Carlos Guerrero, who started, you know, Marshall started out with. Um, but I'm really looking forward to what Michelle 
does with her horses. She hasn't won a race yet, but they've all hit the board. Uh, so I think, you know, her and, and look, there's, there's trainers that have had that li the limelight and have had the success, but ones that I feel as though might step eventually into maybe the Chad Brown, Todd Fletcher roles, uh, Jonathan Thomas, Horacio De Paz. I think those two guys are two of my favorite trainers and I love, you know, picking their horses and, and finding one that you know fits in the race, but also just wows me in the paddock because I know that they're bringing them over in tip top shape. Maggie, thank you so much for coming Thanks, on. Maggie. We nice. really appreciate it. And best of luck this meet. We, we can't wait to watch you and the rest of the gang on the show. You guys do a great job. Well, thank you so much for having me. Sorry for the really loud, obnoxious. No, no, don't, don't All sweat good. that. Please All believe good. me. You're and, 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 and it's only, it, usually it's just job it's usually me being obnoxious. obnoxious. Yeah, yeah, so, so. Exactly. Exactly. But, and, and I am sorry about the, the Ravens uh, comment, but, <laughs> but as a Giants <laughs> fan, you know, hey, but, um, but uh, Giants, it, we, Giants fan, I know we're off. That's it. We're done. Rivals or anything. Not even the same that 2000 Super Bowl? They, they kicked our ass. Exactly. 21 years exactly. ago, John. Uh, but Maggie, Time when we have any, any babies coming in or anything like that, if you want to text me directly, I'll give you the, the, the good and bad of okay. it. Okay. I'll give you, I'll the, give you the skinny. Didn't, I, didn't, didn't I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't offer it to Joe or Acacia or anybody else, but I'll offer it to you. I'll, I'll let you know if Cassie has a good baby for us. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. Thank Appreciate you. it. That was great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Maggie Wolfendale, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. This week's TDN Story of the Week is brought to you by the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project. Find out how you can get involved in racehorse ownership at Canterbury Park this summer with several options and investments ranging from $250 to $10,000. Learn more at racehorseminnesota.com. Big surprise. The story of the week is about Bob Baffert. I know you guys have could not possibly get enough of the Bob Baffert legal news, but we do have a we, we do have an interesting ish wrinkle this week because our own Bill Finley was in Brooklyn, didn't stop by the crib to say hello, but he was in Brooklyn and uh, and covering the the. Uh, uh, the attempt of the the Baffert team to get rid of to appeal the suspension that Naira brought down upon him, saying that he didn't get his due process, which I think is a fairly you know cogent argument. And uh, Bill was there. I, it was a lot of nothing, I think, but at least you were there and you got to see the participants and listen in. What did you yeah. What did you get from that? Well, before we take a deep dive in it, to add some little levity to the what how you uh, started this off. This is a true story. Uh, so Baffert was there and he's walking out after it's over. And uh, the reporter from John's favorite publication, The Blood Horse, said to Bob, hi, Bob. His answer was no comment. <laughs> I, I guess so that shows you how after he like couldn't shut up for, and he's going on, you know, the home shopping network to, to plead his case. Obviously the lawyer s s said, Bob, uh, enough is enough. You know, Joe, it, it, was, it was interesting to me because uh, I had never really been in a courtroom like that before in, in this sort of situation. You know, these, these high powered lawyers making some serious coin. I mean, I want to be those guys. Oh my God. You know, the, what they charge per hour to get this done. For the most part, you heard the same arguments that we've already heard going back and forth. I mean, Naira says he's, the, you know, just he's a scourge on racing. He has to be banned, et cetera. The other side says, uh, you know, Naira is, is you know, un-American because they took away his, his right to due process and they don't have a right to ban him anyway. So we were hoping at the end of the day, the judge would make a decision. She did not. So what it comes down to is this is looking for a temporary injunction. He wants to run in Saratoga. They actually listed three horses, among them Gamine and the ballerina, that he's pointing for the Saratoga meet. So they want to be freed uh, to run in Saratoga. So if they get a temporary restraining order, then Naira cannot obviously 
uh, exclude him uh, going forward. So the idea covering this is it's, it becomes a big guessing game. What is the judge going to decide? And you're looking for hints. I mean, she raises her eyebrows at something. Oh, my goodness. She raised her eyebrows at the fact that they brought up, you know, uh, Smith versus Jones in, in a uh, case in 1944 that dealt with due process. Um, someone who was in the courtroom with me uh, insists that Baffert's side kick butt and that they're going to win this. I, you know, I'm not so sure, but I'm not a, a legal scholar either. And just the other thing, too, is that I'm, I know everybody, I'm, I'm so sick of this. It, it, it's, I came into the sport to write about horse racing. Now, all of a sudden, if I don't have a legal degree, I mean, that's all I, we do anymore, which is really kind of discouraging about the state of racing. So if I had to guess, and it's not necessarily an educated opinion, I do think Baffert is going to get this. And uh, by the time, matter of fact, since we've been in the studio an hour and a half or whatever, it may have even happened as we speak. Um, the judge, to her credit, really understood the issues. There was no one like dumb questions about horse racing. She understood that Saratoga is starting. Uh, it was on Monday, so it was three days away. And a decision has to be made about whether Baffert can run there or not. So, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get the decision between now and next week's show. And once again, the Bob Baffert Report brought to you by whomever um, we can pick up on next week. So, Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the interesting tidbits from that was that the, the Naira lawyers said that Bob Baffert didn't request a hearing and the judge was like, he needs to request a hearing. Yeah. That was one of those little things where you're trying to pick up on any hint yeah. that the judge gives. And so the, the, as far as I understand it, that, and I don't, there's a lot of things I do and don't understand, but the argument from Baffert's side are uh, uh, two, threefold. But one of the big ones, of course, is they denied him due process. Why didn't they just give him a hearing? I yeah. don't understand that. And if they had, maybe the story would be completely different. But it came down to whether or not denying him a hearing violated his due process. And the um, Naira lawyer uh, said something to the effect that, oh, if he would have asked for one, we would have given it to him. That was one point where the judge said, you got to be, you know, didn't say it in so many words, but they heard inflection. What she said was, she was like, almost, you got to be kidding me. That's like, you know, if you rob a bank, you go up to the judge and say, Hey, no one's caught me for robbing this bank. However, I do want a trial uh, to, to get ahead of this. So yeah, th that was a little bit of hint. And, and you know, how significant was that particular incident? It probably was, but again, we will all know within a couple of days to see if, uh, you know, Bob Baffert and John was outside holding up a sign, free Bob Baffert, free Bob Baffert. Uh, whether or not he's going to be able to run at Saratoga. We'll, we'll know soon. Actually, it was Free Britney. That, right. that okay. was my sign was Free oh, Britney. Okay. I'm, I'm kind of yeah. done with this whole Bob Baffert thing. Okay. But, Bill, you also wrote an article that I thought was very interesting on, on another, you know, legal rule issue mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that affected Monmouth Park. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, again, in, the, in this week's segment of Stuff Joe Bianca is Tired of, <laughs> whipping at Monmouth Park. But on Sunday, there were actually two races where the jockeys clearly whipped the horse. One was Carlos Montalvo in the first race with the horse getting out on the turn. He clearly went, and the horse was bearing out, true. He went to the stick. He wins the race on some 25 to 1 shot. And later in the card, there's a jockey no one ever heard of, Carlos E. Lopez, had never ridden a race at Monmouth in his life, and he's riding like it's any other race at any other track, whipping the horse coming down the stretch. So on Friday, the stewards at Monmouth are, are going to meet with these guys, and we'll find out. But this, particularly, the, the Lopez guy has got no defense whatsoever. He's going to get fined, suspended. There's no doubt about that. It'll be five days. But the Montalvo thing will be very interesting because through his agent, he is claiming that because the horse was getting out, he needed to use the whip to keep, to not put himself in a precarious safety situation. The uh, New Jersey Racing Commission has said that you can use the whip uh, in, in any instance where your safety is, is uh, at risk. So it's going to be up to the stewards. And I, you know, I don't know, maybe John, uh, you have a call on that. I don't know. That's a kind of, it's kind of a tough call on that. I mean, it wasn't glaringly obvious that he was in trouble, but at least he has a story. Hey, the horse, I don't want to go over the outside fence judge i had to use the whip there so you know i don't know where that's going to go i think there's some chance he would get off but we'll find out yeah and, and i think you know usually when, when you get in front of the stewards it, it kind of is like a kangaroo court and right. i don't mean that as, as a you know as, as a tongue-in-cheek i mean that like they kind of had the interpretation to you know, the rules that to, to be able to interpret um the way they see it i mean here's a guy with you know you mentioned carlos montalvo who's in the top 10 
jockeys at Monmouth. He's ridden, you know, 80 or Saying so times. <laughs> Thanks, Joe, for that one great comment on the, yeah. on the topic. Yeah. Um, but it's a guy who, you know, who, who's ridden, you know, 80 times or so, you know, around Monmouth Park and knows what the rules are. Now, again, having never been on a thoroughbred racehorse, it's unfair for me to be the judge and jury on this. I will say that watching the head on, the horse was going from the two path to maybe the four path. Now, was that the beginning of him going to the outside rail? I, only the only really the jockey really knows what's going on. Is it a question of hey they did the wrong thing um, by by hitting the horse you know over and over again um, down the stretch? You can make a case as yes, the stewards that that maybe the jockey had the right to to handle the horse, whip the horse one or two times to get him from bearing out. Um, you know again it's a judgment call. It's going to be really on on the shoulders of of the. Uh, of, of the stewards at, at, at this point. Um, I think that, that my guess, my intuition is that the stewards are going to get some pressure from, from ownership of saying, Hey, this is the rule that we implemented. Here's a kid who's ridden a bunch of times around, around this oval. He knows what the rules are. Um, and if we set precedent by saying, well, maybe the horse is bearing out a little bit. So we're going to let you off on this one. Um, is that a slippery slope, mm -hmm. you know, in the grant that I don't think they want to deal with. John, here's a, another question we haven't, um, Touch on this, and I want to ask you as an owner. Uh, I mean, this was just a nothing race. It was a 12-5 claim or something like that. But if the stewards say, you violated the rule, you are suspended, uh, you are fined, et cetera, if you're the owner of the horse that finishes second, do you have a, a case for saying, hey, wait a minute, I got to be put up to first here. You just, this guy broke the rules and just, you know, it's it's different, but not different from a drug positive. You know, just like Mandaloon is eventually going to be put up in the Derby because a rule was broken with Medina Spirit. And that's, a, you know, that's opening up a, a can of worms that I don't think anybody's touched on there. So again, you know, picture yourself in, in the uh, shoes of the owner who finished second there. W would you be looking to say, hey, wait a minute, we're, we're first now? I, I certainly would be okay. looking for that. Absolutely. Whether or not it's a, it's a viable case that you can, you know, that, that you can, um, you know, bring through the legal system. I, I, I don't know. Um, and again, because you mentioned that, that it was, you know, such a lower level claiming race, um, you're probably going to eat up more in, in legal fees than anything else. Um, and not to mention, you'll probably, you know, piss off the powers that be at Monmouth Park by kind of pushing the issue. Um, it, I think it's, it's no different than, you know, we had to scratch a horse, like I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, you know, they caught the guy. Now, do I have the ability to say if we had run and everything, that's a lot of ifs and buts. And, and I just don't know from a legal standpoint, you know, where that would carry. I think you almost have to take it on the chin and say, um, well, you know, you got the unfortunate uh, ruling on this and uh, you finish second. You know, I don't think they're going to DQ the horse. I think they're just going to DQ the winner. I think they're just going to ultimately take action against Montalvo for, for his, uh, you know, whipping. Well, I mean, you also kind of feel screwed as a better, I feel like, because there was no, there was no, there was no inquiry. There was no nothing. The race went official in like 30 seconds and you just, you're watching the race and watching the jockey use the whip and you can't help but think if you bet the runner up, well, he had an unfair advantage and, you know, it was just because he said, you know, that he, that he thought the horse was going to take him to the outer rail. So it's such a, it's such a murky thing that, you know, it's, I, I, to me, it's either let him use the whip in like a, in, in a handful of strikes, a, a, a race, or don't let him carry the whip at all, because then it just becomes the, the word of the jockey to say, well, I thought I was, I was in danger. And how could you possibly prove that one way or another, just from watching the race, outside it's just it's it makes it it makes it very tough to adjudicate and i think it's a mess i think it's a mess and i think it was a predictable mess um and that's that that's why i was i was against it from the jump but you know it's it seems like that's the way that that these things are going but there are going to be a lot of situations like this where it's hard to figure out you know whether or not the jockey truly felt he was in danger or he was trying to gain an advantage you know that's 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 where we're headed is a lot more situations like this i think here's another thing too and i'm a no whip guy so i'm i'm on uh, oh really yeah really uh -huh. but there's I'm, another situation that sooner or later we're going to get and it wouldn't just be at Monmouth uh, because at every other track now you can only hit the horse two times underhanded then you have to sing um you know sweet caroline until you can hit it again and then you have to pick, pat the horse to make sure he's okay and can i hit you again? So let's take the Has. Well, let's take the Haskell. So Flavian Pratt and uh, Florent Giroux, Mandaloon and Hot Rod Charlie are coming down to the line, nose to nose, nose to nose, nose to nose. A million dollar race, grade one on the line, six hundred thousand means uh, sixty thousand in their own pockets. If you're facing only a five day suspension and a five dollar fine, right. 
you have no incentive not to hit the yeah. horse. I'm, I, I'm not saying it's going to happen in the house. That's going to happen sooner or later uh, where somebody's going to say, screw it. You know, uh, the, the risk and reward here, I, I'm going to hit the horse and I know I'm going to get suspended, but at the end of the day, I'm going to have, you know, a few more shuckles in my bank account here. Yeah. I mean, and that's what happened. Didn't that happen with the Saudi cup? Uh, yeah, one of those big races? Yeah, where he, where yeah, he yeah. got fined like $8 million. Yeah, yeah. no, but like I, there, there are going to be big races where it's going to be just a, a, a percentage, a tiny percentage, and you figure it's worth it because because, you know, your your first responsibility is to the owner. And the, if the owner has to pay your fine, so be it. Like, that's, yeah, there are going to be people who are going to try to bend the rules that way. And, you know, with there not being any uniform standard and not being any, any you know, punishment necessarily that's going to cost a jockey their license or a long time, a long term suspension. That's I think that's that's where we're, we're headed for sure. But in that, in that example, it's not going to matter because according to, to you, it's going to be the sprinter that's running long for the first time in the Haskell and whoever's riding that horse, it's going to be the well, I was going to say, gonna it's going to be, it's going to be a moot point when following sea winds by 15 lengths. But no, I was, I actually said when we first talked about that horse, he might be a little too fast for his own good. So I'm just, I'm just talking some crap here, but we'll see if he, <laughs> if it does happen, I'm going to act like I wait, was serious wait, the whole you're time. You're talking crap. Bill announces that he's an anti-whip guy. What is this world coming to? I can't believe this. <laughs> it's all the same. Even if we, even back in the studio. <laughs> Studio with all different, the kinks. Different venue. That's all the same. <laughs> all right. So I don't, I don't know if you guys remember. I'm just a bit disappointed that you guys forgot you, to wear your top hats today. It's uh... <laughs> John is the only guy rich enough on this show to own a top hat. <laughs> I'm sure he's wearing his somewhere. Contrary to popular belief, I was not at Royal Ascot last week. Um, but also to quelch this rumor, it was not because I couldn't afford to rent a monocle. When John was off the podcast, a little bit ago, it was a couple of weeks ago, that just so happened to be the same week at, a, at at Royal Ascot that he had the horse running. And, you know, we were talking that he was hobnobbing with the queen and rubbing elbows with royalty. He actually wasn't there, but the only reason he gave was that he didn't have the right attire. He didn't have a top hat or, or a monocle. And I think we just, <laughs> we just so happened to have a, uh, a top hat for Mr. Mr. John Green for next time that he wants to go. And a Mr. Peanut monocle as well. <laughs> so there you go, man. You're all set for Royal Ascot next year. And uh, <laughs> really it. this really is yeah, a monocle. It is. Where'd you, where'd you find a monocle? <laughs> Don't worry. We have our secrets here at the, at the writer's room. There he is. What that hat cost you? About Mr. $1.49. <laughs> Too big. More than the camera. I know, right? Well, more than the $50 camera. Mr. Peanut sure. in all his glory. Bill, you've never looked better like that <laughs> than through this monocle, I have to say. I have to say. Well, that's, that's outstanding. Yeah, so very, now you're ready. I am. I am ready. All I got to do is get the audience with the queen now, and, and I'm <laughs> and I'm good to go. Wow, this is you know what I've I've earned a lot of trophies and accolades over my time, but I I can honestly say I've never had a used monocle as a, <laughs> as a gift. I have to thank you both, and I'm sure this is coming out of our travel budget, yep. isn't it? So tune in next week when John shows up with pink eye. <laughs> <laughs> Brought to you by Pfizer. This, this segment brought to you by Pfizer. <laughs> and, the, 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 you know, the queen might need a tax consultation, so we'll try to make that happen. <laughs> Can we make well. her guest of the week? Yep. I really honestly can't see through this. That, that's, that's really amazing. But, no, thank you, guys. But, yeah. And aside from the fact that the top hat's, like, four sizes too big for me, too. You're, that's you, good. You give, it, you give it to me. I have a bigger head than you, so I, no, I think no I'm No question right. about that. Yeah. Well, yep. I, well I, I assume I'll be the guest, the your, your guest in tow next year when you're going back to Royal Ascot. So. There, there's, there's no question you'll be in the top five. <laughs> You're, you're still in consideration. You're going to need probation. a bigger plane. We're gonna, you're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> we'll be right back after this message from the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project. All right, so this was this was a, a an experiment. This was a this was a, a a trial run for coming back into the studio. It's obviously a little different now. With with we want to have the cameras in the studio because John's insatiable need for 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 his insatiable vanity and and need for fame. We have to have the cameras now, uh, and 
you know, just because the, the cameras went black and white, that's only because John and Bill are so old that the camera was trying to adjust to a more comfortable and familiar era with them. But uh, we're having, a, we're just ha had a few technical difficulties. It might hurt a phone ring, might hurt a little beeping here or then, but we're working through it. And overall, we're going to be in the studio going forward next week. However, we're going to be back on Zoom. John and Bill have some prior commitments. So don't freak out that we're, we're back on Zoom. We're not going back to purgatory just yet. We'll wait for the next pandemic for that. Um, so yeah, next week we'll be on Zoom. And then uh, in general, we're going to be back in the studio, but we might do, you know, one or two uh, remote shows from, from here on out. But so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. A reminder that the Keeneland September Yearling Sale starts Monday, September 13th. You can learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. I want to thank Bill Finley to my right, John Green to my left, our Green Group guest of the week, Maggie, Wolfend Maggie Wolfendale, our producer, Patty Wolf, who came all the way down from Connecticut at 530 this morning to set all this up. We really appreciate her. Also, our associate producer, Katie Ritz, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. It's good to be back. We'll see you next week.